welcome back to Business of Design Week 2020. I am Michelle, your program host, and I hope you did enjoy our last session with Alan Chan. Up next, we have a series of presentations and we'll be examining the M Plus, a new museum of visual culture that will open its Yuzhongye de Mohon designed building in 2020 in Hong Kong's West Kowloon District, West Kowloon Cultural District, excuse me. Dorian Chong, Deputy Director and Chief Curator, will introduce the panel and we'll hear from Kingsley J. Zakira, GM for Marketing and Customer Experience, West Kowloon Cultural District Authority, as well as Thomas Witterschauvin, Co-Founder, Designer and Director of Thonic. Please welcome Dorian, Kingsley and Thomas. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon and, and thank you for joining for this session. Uh, and thank you for BODW inviting us to giving this opportunity to present our work. This is the signature event for the Hong Kong design scene here. And my name is Iko Yokoyama. I'm the lead curator at uh, M Plus. And then also I will be moderating this session. And then today, so I will also quickly introduce uh, on the the end of the sofa, Dorian Chun, Deputy Director Curatorial and then the Chief Curator of M Plus. And he will talk a little bit quick update about our museum project. And then on next to me, we have a King Sri Jasekela, the managing di uh, general manager, the marketing and the customer experience. As we're going to talk about M Plus branding today. So the Kingsley will give us a little like a brief, uh, what was a design brief was given to the designer who we selected, Tonic, Amsterdam based designer. And then let's see if to, uh, Thomas is here today on the big screen. Thomas, hello. Hi, Thomas. Are you there? Do you hear us? Hi, okay? hello. Hi. Yeah, so Thomas is uh, joining yes, from well. Amsterdam, I guess, at your new studio and home. Right? I guess. <laughs> no, at home. No? Okay, you're at home today. Okay, anyway, it's a Saturday. Okay, so before, so we will soon come back to you, Thomas, but then I will hand over to Dorian first. Thank you so much, Iko, for that uh, introduction, and thank you, as always, of course, the Business of Design Week for giving us an opportunity to give an update on the development of the project, the M Plus project. Um, but we're very excited to be also introducing um, very possibly one of the first public instances that we will be sharing the uh, institution's branding that we have been working on for quite some time. Um, but that's really the meat of the um, presentation and discussion. So I'm just setting the stage here to remind the audiences what M Plus is. Um, so this is part of our mission statement that we are a new museum dedicated to collecting, exhibiting, and interpreting visual culture of the 20th and 21st centuries. So as the MC introduced the panel, the M Plus is a museum of visual culture based and rooted in Hong Kong, but with a global perspectives. So the project has been going on for almost a decade at this point. And as you can see here, we are building one of the largest museums of uh, largest modern um, and contemporary uh, visual culture museums in the world. And just to give you a sense of the scale that the M plus building um, is about 65,000 square meters. And in terms of its a physical scale, as well as its a cultural ambition, it uh, is very much up there with other major institutions such as Tate Modern in London and Museum of Modern Art in New York. M plus is being built in the West Kowloon Culture District. Um, uh, one of the largest and most ambitious cultural institution, uh, cultural district building projects in the world of more than 40 hectares with a dozen um, cultural institutions to be built over the years. And then um, the institutions are already coming online and the next up is M plus and that we are planning to open sometime in 2021 more uh, second half of 2021 is what we are now projecting considering all of the delays and disruptions that happened in this unprecedented year so i'm going to just show you a quick video 
um, of the building construction. So here is a Herzog and Demeron designed building that has been under construction since 2015. Um, it is really at the very final stage of construction. You can see here the landscaping on the, this expansive rooftop terrace is being completed. And then we're in the final stage of statutory inspection for us to attain the occupation permit. And of course, that sets the, uh, the, the course for what the museum professionals do to go in and install uh, a signif significant part of the permanent collection that we have been building. And that's also a very important aspect of the work that we have been doing over the last several years to build a permanent collection that um, uh, from scratch to now, which consists of almost 8,000 objects plus more uh, close to 40,000 archival items, um, a collection of design and architecture, moving image and visual art and Hong Kong visual culture that we have been building. Um, and then also the team that we have been building, an international team of museum professionals, now almost 200 people coming from many nationalities. So just to finish off my little introduction, I will just show you some images of one of the features of the Herzog and Demeron Design Building. So the um, harbor, Victoria Harbor facing south side of the building's facade is lined with LED lights, very high powered LED lights. Um, and then here are some images of the testing that we did uh, in early November. Uh, so seen from uh, on the waterfront of the cultural district about 200 meters away, as well as on the bottom left image um, seen from the, across the harbor from the central pier. So very high powered LED monitors that will be used for institutions branded messages um, as well as our uh, cultural content, which will distinguish this uh, particular medium from other, many other LED facades that you will see on Victoria Harbor. So I think this is perhaps a good point to hand it over to Kingsley to introduce the whole branding project that is so essential in setting, in establishing the infrastructure for this very ambitious new institution. Thank you, Dorian. Um, I think uh, it's important, you know, to start a little bit with, uh, when we talk about branding, quite clearly a museum of this scale and status needs a significant brand. Uh, and that's a fundamental thing that applies to all major museums, but it's particularly important for M plus because one of the areas of M plus is that it covers is design. So uh, that became an important part of the project. But as part of developing the new brand, it was also important to consider what we already had in place. And we start with the logo. M plus has had a logo in place since 2014. Uh, it was designed by the London-based agency North as part of a larger branding project, and it's been in place and used across all the materials for M Plus for a number of years and has become quite familiar. Uh, if you look at it, you'll recognize some elements within it, in significantly the emphasis on the plus, and that was an important idea. M Plus has a very, very strong identity. The idea of the plus is very powerful. The idea that M Plus is more than a museum. Uh, you can, if you look at it, you can see there's some element there that reflects itself. I, you see with the plus in the design, you have the horizontal plinth and you have the vertical tower. And there's an angle that runs under the plus, which symbolizes the light, the shadow from the, you know, from the shadow under the building. But it also creates this interesting angle idea. The M plus logo was developed as part of a wider project, which included the West Kowloon logo, and you can see it here sitting underneath. The West Kowloon logo uses the same font and features again the same angle idea cut into the Chinese and the Latin characters. And you can really see how at the middle of it, you see at the heart of this, the T of West and the K of Kowloon become an HK. So symbolizing the idea that Hong Kong is at the heart of this project. So this was something that we had already that we didn't want to get rid of. We wanted to work with it. And that was an important part of the project. Uh, important thing about logos is recognizing the power they have in terms of their strength of visibility. So they have to work at scale. They also have to 
be able to be visible at small scale and have that same strength. And the N Plus logo being very compact had that. So we were very much going out trying to find a design agency who could take that and take it further into a new direction. Um, the M Plus logo up to now had been used with a series of uh, posters for exhibitions. Uh, these are all the exhibitions at the M Plus Pavilion. And there was a star that was in place that was developed by 2x4, another agency, which worked on a label model and also focused heavily on type, which is a pretty um, you know, conventional way to go and worked effectively but really, really didn't deal with some of the things we really wanted to do. So we had a tender, and in the end, we were very, very pleased and excited to meet Thonic and select them to do the branding work. Uh, Thonic, and you'll hear more from Thomas, are a Dutch agency, and we really, really kind of, they really resonated with us because they were a small, young team, but they had a lot of experience. Um, things that we really, really liked about them was their bold use of color, uh, you can see in the work they did for Holland Festival, they were able to create brand identities that were colorful, diverse, but still had a coherent idea. We also liked the idea that they could really work with scale, as they did in the Holland Festival. You know, they did here for um, uh, the Boymans Museum, also in uh, work they do for the... Um, uh, um, uh, power Station of Art in Shanghai. And they've done some very, very scaled up elements, as well as lots of digital. But also, having a lot of experience, they understood this had to be related back to exhibitions, had to work in harmony with the artwork, and that was something that was very, very important. The other thing that was useful to us, or very powerful and resonated, was the fact they'd already done quite a considerable amount of work in Asia, and that was useful, and that showed they had a good experience of understanding, working in different cultures. And I also personally really, really responded to the fact that being Dutch, they. Um, they, they were used to dealing with English as a second language. And again, you can see how they are very, very strong with color. And this was something that really, really resonated with us because inevitably, you know, in our previous work, we had a lot of gray. The building has a lot of gray. There's a lot of concrete. And we really wanted to add something to it. But ultimately also, it's a very, very different approach to brand. And the reason why is because you have to look at adaptations. And thing again that Thonic had done is they'd worked with existing identities and taken them to a new level. They'd worked in how they can in different formats, whether it's digitally or whether it's in retail. And they had a very, very uh, adventurous approach to this, which is something that I think we really, really wanted to see, something that would push us to a new level. And that's really a significant thing because realistically, the museum of brand to, of today has to be much, much more than a museum. The modern museum has to be fully, fully engaged in digital. It has to have a very, very strong retail element. It has to deal with blockbuster exhibitions where you have this star content, but you still need to maintain the brand. And it has to work in areas like learning and participation. And, from experience, the issue is, is the fact that often these different elements stretch the brand and can actually kind of break it down. So the idea was creating a structure that would allow us to tie these things together, that would give them freedom to thrive and also remain part of the brand identity. So that was the brief that we gave Thonic. Okay, thank you, Kingsley. So we will uh, call Thomas again. So I, the Thomas Wiedeshoven, uh, hello, Thomas, back again. So I uh, said, so, so we briefly introduced the, the co-founder and the di design and director, Tonic. So we will hear the Thomas, how did you respond it with our brief, but it's also the, you know, how you create a very new, strong visual identity, which is kind of how it's integrated to the Hong Kong visual landscape. So please. Okay. Thank you. I, I see myself uh, a little bit slow compared to what you see. So I have to speak a little bit slowly, I think, in my opinion. Okay, let's try. <laughs> so um, we will talk quite a bit about the uh, color of M+, but first I want to show you a few images of our work. work. This is us. Uh, and this is our new building. 
So uh, we just uh, made a new building in Amsterdam. We were able to get a plot in the center of the city. We were able to, uh, to build a whole uh, studio with uh, run downstairs and a very um, typical stripey uh, <clears throat> design. Um, it attracts a lot of attention, I must say, but it also really fits into the, into the fabric of the city on that spot. And I think those two things are really important for us that we, that we really want to make designs that stand out, that attract attention to things that are valuable, things like culture, we consider to be very valuable and it should be visible. And that's what we try to help achieve. Uh, on the other hand, um, we also want it to fit into the fabric of the city and to fit into the communication that is already there. So that's how we work. And in that way, this whole building is a manifesto of how we design. Um, as Kingsley said, we did quite a few projects in China and we even had an exhibition last year in Shanghai. Uh, and we made a book, an English book in the beginning, but it was also translated into Chinese. It's called Why We Design. And in this book, we give 11 reasons why we design. So the public domain is one reason. Uh, the visibility is one reason, but also impact and social change are reasons for us to design. So these are the 11 chapters. And then if you go to one of these examples of, the, of what we do, you have the Holland Festival, which brings the world of art, uh, performing arts to Amsterdam. So it's a really international performing arts festival. And as you can see, for such a client, we work with them for years and we do quite a bit of things for them. So we start, of course, with design strategy. And uh, but in this case, we also did type design, visual identity campaigns, etc. cetera. Um, we started as a graphic design studio 25 years ago, but by now we are online first, we're digital first. And uh, we, from that digital uh, experiments, we often derive our images. So this is a poster, but it started with a film. And of course, we apply it to many, many media. And also this cross-media approach is very important also for M+. We will see how color can work at that. For the Museum Boymers from Beuningen, we actually also inherited a bit of a logo. They had a three lines uh, B as a logo, but they used it in a, yeah, in a way that was not really effective. Um, so we applied it in a different way. We went back to the designer of the original typeface, which was Lance Wyman, who did the three lines type uh, for the Mexico Olympics in, in, um, in 1968. And since uh, previous designers had adopted the lines, we went back to him, discussed it with him, how we could reuse it and make it more now. And of course, we, we use a lot of uh, moving graphics to, to promote the experience, the, the exhibitions at, uh, at the site. So um, we went back to culture, to the cultural heritage, really talked to, uh, to him, but also applied it in a totally new way. And indeed, we, we were able to have, in the total customer journey, we were able to have a very strong moment of arriving at the museum, where we did, together with artists, uh, <clears throat> we did, uh, together with the artists, we, we did a whole plan on the floor of the address. And then, um, of course, we make uh, um, campaigns. <laughs> and we make them online, offline, and we make party flyers. This is a, an online party flyer for the, for the opening. So a little bit the same happened in the Power Station of Art. Here we really had to reuse the logo as it was. Uh, it was made by, um, it's a very big plant, energy plant in Shanghai. And the logo was made by Hope Soon. And uh, it only, not only reflects uh, the building with the chimney, but it also is a reference to the word done contemporary. So it was a very meaningful logo and we thought we, we could use it again, but it's also a little bit of, I don't know, um, old fashioned to have this logo everywhere. 
So in a way, okay, let's open up the logo. Uh, let's look at it again and see what it's made of, because that's the strength of the logo is that it's made of a few elements. And if you take out the elements, then you get a whole new energy into, uh, into the identity and you can make the logo into a toolbox and the toolbox you can apply to many items. And then, uh, of course, you can also apply it to posters. So in the Emerging Curators program, we stay very close to the logo, uh, but in all the other elements, we, we just take the toolbox and use it for the campaigns. So then the M+. Now, the M+, is a logo that we were really excited about because it's, uh, first of all, the name of M+, is so, is so well chosen because it's uh, so clear what it means. It means more than a museum, but it's also so strong because it's only symbols this is the most important so the m is still a western type but the plus is something that i think the whole world can relate to and that is something that of course a museum like m plus wants to achieve that it's cross-cultural we um, went for a simple typeface in chinese uh, that would work very well with a typeface that we had developed ourselves uh, for a Dutch uh, broadcaster, uh, it's called the Simplistic. And the nice thing about the Simplistic is that it's, uh, it's quite geometrical, mathematical, geometrical, but it also has some quirky elements, giving it a, a feeling of now. So we were really keen on this typeface again, and it, it combines really well with the Noto. As you can see in this image, you can even flow from one, from one to the other in one line. But then, we don't, we, I think we don't want to be so different in typography, but we want to be different in color. And that started uh, with thinking about how can you really be cross-cultural uh, if you're working with visual culture and how can, you, how can you reach people and attract people and, and stimulate people uh, across all cultures. And then we turned into biology because we don't share the culture around the world. All cultures are different, but we do share the biology of our body. And that is also because when we were, of course, as Kingsley put it, we were picked because of our color, colorful designs. And we have these colorful designs because they really stand out in the public domain. And we want to stand out in the public domain because we really only connect to valuable uh, clients, to, to things that we really feel that adds something to society like culture does. But then we started discussing um, culture, the, the color uh, as we went to Hong Kong to talk to Suhanya and the whole team. And then the word gray kept on coming up. So there is a lot of gray in Hong Kong, but also in the museum, there's a lot of gray. And, uh, and, and then at the end, Suhanya at some point said, we always start with color, but in the end, we end up with a gray item, with a gray uh, review, whatever. So we went back to uh, Amsterdam and we thought, how can we combine this, this feeling of gray, which you could say is an expression of a modest and inclusive sense of quality. And how can we combine that with a color and, uh, and make it into an identity? So this is gray and we started with 50% gray because that's an interesting color because you can put white text on it and black text on it and it's equally legible. But then we started with biology and we of course knew and rediscovered and researched the fact that actually two kinds of cells in our eyes to see and one of this type of cells sees black and white sees the whole range, but others pick up on the different colors. So we have one cells, a set of cells called the rods, they see black and white. And then we have three types of cones, which see green, red, and blue. And if you combine all that information, you get a color image in your brain. So part of it will see reds, part of it will see blue, and part of it will see green. Other cells will see the black and white image and together it will form full color image in your brain. And now this funny thing is because it's different cells, it is a little bit like if you, if you stimulate the different cells in different ways, then you get a very titillating effect. So if you have 
an image that has very little uh, contrast in, in grayness, but you have a strong contrast in color, since, you're have, since you ha your senses are, are titillated in a way, um, in a different mode, then you, then you really feel something. And you have the same, maybe to, to compare it to warm and cold. So if you put in something really cold, then first you feel warm. So, although it's not supposed to feel that way, you do feel it because the, the warm uh, nerves are, are higher to the, to the surface. So they are, they are uh, attracted first. And because there is a, a climax feeling, you get, you get this effect. It's difficult to explain, but it works. The effect when we do this with color, we call it a visual tickle. So, if you look at the color and you look at the outer, then you can, of course, the, the rainbow, like uh, yellow, red, purple, blue, green, yellow, etc. That's the rainbow. But the red, if you would take a black and white image of it, would be quite dark, and the purple would be very dark, and the yellow would be very, very light. So if we want to have colors that are all like 50% black, uh, then we have to adjust the yellow to a mustard, and we have to take the red into a pink and we have to take the purple into a lilac. That means that two important colors from the Chinese culture, which is red and yellow, are not in our system because the yellow has become a more muddy color and the red has become a pinky color. And I think that is interesting. So if you take this as a color ring, uh, we just adjusted it from the rainbow, sort of. Um, that you take a black this. So there is no difference anymore between any of the colors if you take a black and white photo. There are many ways of taking a black and white photo. The way we did it is putting it in Photoshop and turning it into a grayscale. And then you get this image. So um, that's the idea that we have, that we will use all colors in the identity that if you put a black and white photo of make of them, it will be 50% gray. And we have a feeling that this reflects the effect ton, uh, Hong Kong has. So you have all the gray high rises, and then uh, at the bottom you have all these titillating effect full neon lights to shine out. And in a way, the combination of the two is exactly what we reflect in the color system for M+. Um, to make it work, in the identity manual, uh, because in the end there will be something like 10,000 colors that have a 50% gray uh, effect if you, if you turn them in a grayscale amidst 1 million colors, but still 10,000 colors is a bit too much to work with. So what we did is we took the ring, it's the second ring in this one, and from that we gray it to the center. And in the outer ring we have in between colors. So we try to find colors that sort of are in between lilac and blue, that are in between blue and green. Uh, of course, that's a turquoise. So this is a color ring that we can work with within the identity. Now you, <laughs> and then, oh yeah, okay. So, um, so basically this is the, the, essen the essential color ring for M+, and uh, if you turn it around and spin it, then it becomes uh, gray. Uh, the nice thing about the system is that it's a concept, which means that we don't pick a particular color, but we, we pick a concept, which means that you can apply it to RGB colors on screen, which is, of course, at the moment, the most important medium. And, of course, also with the facade, which is a screen, will also be important. But you can easily, it will look a little bit different, but you will have the same effects if you use full color uh, printing. And if you add a few Pantone colors, because full color printing is uh, notorious for not printing well orange and, uh, and green. So um, if you add a few Pantone colors, you can also have the same effect, but with colors. And this is how we try to put it in the identity manual. Uh, we, we have high contrast colors, we have medium contrast colors and low contrast colors. So in the high contrast colors, we use two out of four high contrast bright colors. Then we go back to one co bright color and then to zero. So in the low contrast, you can really have this sense of gray, um, yeah, ton sur ton, 
um, colors next to each other that really reflect a certain element of quality. And in the brighter ones, you can be out there and, and shine and be visible. So this um, color system really works uh, across media and cross color system, but it also can even work uh, in totally different media like a lunchbox, because lunchboxes, of course, we cannot make for M+, but we can choose from a color set that is there, we can choose colors that uh, really reflect our identity. And then in the building, as Kingsley already mentioned, uh, we see that uh, there is a nice element of the logo in the building. That's, I thought, was the most uh, yeah, special part of the logo. And we worked with that image um, on the first uh, uh, project that we did, which is the annual review 2019. So in the orange part, you can see the part of the logo that reflects the, the image of the building. And then you have another seven colors from our system uh, onto a greenish gray uh, background. And if you combine all these colors inside, we use them as inlays. So these are the first two, uh, the first two colors. You see the orange and the next one. So if you combine those, you get this. And then as we move on, we make uh, the, the logo smaller and smaller so that we derive a strong pattern from the logo, always with these colors in mind that we had on the, on the cover. Of course, we also use the colors in the uh, infographics. This is the typography, simplistic and noto. And then again, we have these dividing pages where the pattern uh, becomes more and more small and you get a, a very different titillate the smaller. In the end of the book, there is an explanation of the whole concept. And on the back of it is the last part of the logo of the M. Um, yeah, we made a nice, uh, because it's a gift, so we made a nice gift wrapping for the review. And this is the most uh, expressive set of colors that you can make with M+. And with that, I wanted to end my presentation. Okay, thank you, Thomas, for your presentation. Uh, and then also this was, uh, yeah, beyond uh, the annual report, this is the first time we actually showing ever to the outside of, uh, to the, yeah, so this is absolutely preview of our little bit of new branding. So I hope you got a little uh, excited to see a little bit and then how we're going to apply it soon, you will see it. Uh, to, you know, to also open up the, the, the discussion, the, based on your the color ring, the, the palette you gave it to us, which is uh, or created to us, which I'm very excited. So I would like to ask a little bit on the color palette, a little bit more. You know, so as also you said, like the Kingsley also mentioned in the beginning was conventional way, maybe the graphic designer work on typography, but it's also color choice has been very more often the subjective or the personal choices. But here for the tonic, you have really applied the kind of research based process to choose the color for us. And then I know you have been kind of experimenting with this, uh, the famous Johannes Eaton's uh, the color theory, the Bauhaus uh, teacher. He was uh, the, he wrote a very influential color teaching book, so to say, from 1970, the elements of color. And then actually I found the one very interesting, the, the phrase, which I quote just one line. Uh, I shall try to build the the uh, service, serviceable, the vehicle that will help all who are interested in the problem of color artistry. So in one way, so you gave us a new vehicle, the color vehicle, which the M plus can ride on uh, to, for us to kind of use for the long learn of the, our visual identity. So what is your advice to, you know, how we can be a very good user you know, also because this is, you give a kind of the palette, but it's also not very typical, like a fixed uh, template system, the graphic identity. So it's ample room for the, the interpretation and then how we're going to use it. So it's, it's, we are very excited, but it's also like, you know, we would like to have a little your tips, how we can be a very good user of this uh, identity. So, um, what we have experienced in uh, working for the Power Station of Art and for the Museum Boymans is that it's very important to have 
a sort of a moment where everything comes together. But then after that, you really have to have a lot of possibilities. Because uh, a museum, on the one hand, uh, a lot of people see only a very few items of the museum, a very few contact moments with the, with the communication. But others have a lot of it because they're in the inner circle. And that means that you have to have a system that will always be also interesting for your inner circle. So it has to have a really wide, wide range uh, of possibilities to work with it. And on the other hand, it has to be recognizable. So in the whole customer journey, it has to add up. But on the other hand, it has to also be experimental enough for those people who are really part of, of a very uh, intense customer journey uh, that they also have on all the touch points something new. So that is what we're working on. So in the beginning, we, would, we wanted to keep it totally open. So we said, okay, this is the idea and everybody should work with it. Uh, but as we were working on the, uh, the website, for instance, and on the merchandising, uh, Kingsley, for one, uh, made it clear that we had to limit it a little bit. So within, within the identity manual, there will be very simple keys uh, where you can pick uh, two or four colors that uh, work together. Um, and then uh, if you want to be more elaborate or, or if you have a special project or you have a very good designer, uh, of course, they can go back to the original concept and be more experimental with it. So there will be simple keys, but it will also stay a very open field. Yeah, so that, that was really interesting. Almost like, you know, maybe all the M plus staff are going to be very well educated in the color system in the in few years. But uh, Kingsley, so maybe can you tell like what was most, I mean, you told me, to, of course, it's a color, but what do you saw the most potential in the Tonix presentation when we're looking at many different other presentations? Well, um, I, think, I think really it was interesting because generally when it comes to museum branding, a lot of them are very, very monolithic, you know, and there's a very, very strong corporate color. And I think that goes back to the point Thomas is making. They become quite kind of familiar and there's, there's nothing surprising about them. And also they adapt very well for, you know, a very kind of shock and awe approach for exhibitions. But the problem is, is the fact that they, they, they don't really adapt well to animation and digital. They don't, really, they don't mix at all to the retail. So they become quite limiting. Um, and I think that was really what was exciting here, is the potentiality of all this, where you can really see how the colors actually, um, that we ha our branding will hopefully invite creativity. It won't limit creativity that you often see in terms of a style guide. It will actually you know, get people to start thinking about possibilities. And, and to be honest, in the work that's happened so far in M+, it's been really refreshing to see how people have adopted the idea and how different teams, like the web team, the retail team, have really, really run with it. And they are really seeing possibilities and becoming quite excited by it. And I think that's a very, very different thing. And, 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 and I feel that the good thing is, is that, uh, you know, w this project has a, has a long kind of gestation period, a long build up, and it will have a long life. You feel that people won't get tired of it um, and it will grow with the organization. Yeah, that's, it's really like for this, you said the retail team, web, it's not just badging, like just put the template, put it in there. So that's also kind of everybody who involves this, uh, the museum activities, so they have to be a little bit actively involved in this identity. And then also the question to Dorian, so maybe like we as a curator is often doesn't want to have a much screaming visual identity around it when we do the exhibitions because the artwork, design object, that's the main things. But we actually took this very bold approach. So what was your feeling about that? I, you know, it, it wasn't really uh, difficult to sign on to it. I mean, there are three of the uh, four people who um, were part of um, doing the technical assessment and, and, and awarding um, the, this project to Tonic. And I think we were 
could immediately sense intuitively that this has uh, so many possibilities, uh, as well as the flexibility that will be built into it, that I don't think, I mean, just based on what Tonic had already done, but along the process, I don't think there have been moments where we felt like, oh my goodness, like this is going to actually lessen what we do rather than amplify. I think you're totally right. I think the curators, you know, us curators, can be a very rigid kind of a species. Um, that's part of our DNA. Um, but the whole institutional branding is about both enhancing and amplifying the content that curators are the main people who are creating, but also thinking about the impact publicly. Um, and then that's not necessarily the first thing that the curators think about, but for institution, it's essential. And so I think what Tonic has created is exactly that, because that it has literally the range and the palette that can adapt to all kinds of images, all kinds of um, visual effects, that, that it will, uh, yeah, it is extremely adaptable and flexible system. And I think it also aligns very well with what M plus is, that it is not insisting on one particular kind of a canonical art history or cultural history, but it really in, uh, explores interstitious, interdisciplinarity, um, something that is rooted in particular histories, but that are about the blurry gray areas. Yeah, in the visual culture, yes. And then the, so um, the, maybe I would like to also go something like a continued color, but it's also the technically, uh, the, maybe Thomas, because you were talking about this when you said this is the 50% the black, this is the, 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 also the coloring uh, matching to that. And then you talked about this mustard and pink and you calibrate a little bit. That's also a little bit to do with accessibility, isn't it? So because as a public institution and the West Kowloon, so we are very um, uh, care. So this, it's not just a fun, it is very functional. And then can you tell a little bit about this uh, function, uh, the accessibility thinking behind this uh, scheme? Yeah, so on the one hand, if you pick middle gray colors, it means that the, the white text and the black text will be both equally readable on the background color. So that is a really um, a very good way of uh, having a color set for an institution. So for instance, if you have a yellow in your color palette, you will never be able to put white text on it because it will not be visible. So since we are in the mid range, it opens up the possibility of both white and black text on it. So the, the team who was working in New York on the web design, uh, they were excited about the idea. And so they did apply those colors and they did apply white and black text on it. But uh, in online, there is also sort of tests in contrast uh, that you have to apply to if you want to be accessible for everybody, if you want to be open to everybody. Uh, you have a certain tools online that you have to test the colors in. And then uh, a few of our colors, although they were 50% gray, failed the test. So it was very interesting that uh, in theory, they should have been able to match uh, the test and to, 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 be, to be readable enough. I think they are readable enough, but uh, the machine did not think so. Uh, so we had to adjust a little bit. And actually, I always like it when you have a very strong concept that really makes a very specific set uh, of uh, uh, tools for the identity that are different from all sets if you work from the other side, which would be uh, taste. Um, it's, it's sort of, you have to as, as approaches in time. So it's something about for aesthetic reasons and for, for a certain taste and a certain style and trend and time, or do you go the other way and you come up with a concept? And that's where we normally operate. So we, we, we work with concepts. That means that we are also ourselves a little bit uh, um, surprised by the outcome. So it's, it's already in essence experimental if you work that way around, because you don't work from the visual, but you work from the idea and the outcome will be also for the designer, uh, an experiment and a surprise. But if you work that way, sometimes you have to adopt the, the radical idea to, uh, to the pragmatic situation of the reality. And I think 
a designer should be good, quite loose in that. Uh, so uh, we had fun actually adapting the colors a tiny, tiny bit so that they could pass the test. So some of the colors that you find online into our system, you will find that they are 52 or 53% black or sometimes 47% black. Uh, but we did find the whole color wheel, we could find it uh, with small adjustments uh, fitting the tool of uh, accessibility. And of course, accessibility is one of the main uh, things that M plus wants to achieve. Thank you. Um, let's say, uh, maybe what I should say, there's a few questions from the audience as well. I will pick some. Uh, so the first question is, uh, on top of the museum visual identity, is there any uh, extension signage facility to enhance the visitors explore experience in the M plus museum? Um, maybe King Sri, do you want to reply? Uh, yes, ab absolutely. And I think that's one of the central things. As, as I mentioned, I think one of the things we really liked about Thonic's design was that ability to work at scale. You know, they, you know, the strength of that. And it was something that we'd, look, we'd kind of come to realize also as we were looking at the M plus building, as you we were looking at the renderings, how much gray there was. It was actually a conversation we actually had with um, the architects about how much gray there was in the building and the scale of that building. So the idea that color could play a part in that and also that color could harmoniously fit with the gray is very, very interesting. So it's not about having color that, you know, that clashes with the background, it, it will work with that background. And, I, and, and that's definitely something there. We're looking at how this works in terms of the uh, internal digital signage, the, um, the, the wall spaces around the uh, outside the exhibition areas. And obviously another big area of this is, uh, as Dorian showed, the facade and how it can really, really work on the facades, which would be a very, very exciting opportunity. So yes, the idea of these, this, this, this approach to color will flow all the way through. And I think that's, again, one of the great strengths of the system. See, yeah, so it's like the, I, when I saw the presentation, I really saw, you know, how they, the medium connects, like as you said, our building is very, lot of concrete, so it's very monochromic, the, the building, but so it's the, the identity will really stands out, but at the same time also with other, lot of the other material which go out from the building through posters, maybe tram wraps and the social medias in different texture. So that's go into the city of Hong Kong, but it's also the Grover. So this is the, the color wheel is a kind of universal accord uh, creating. So it's, it's connect to Hong Kong, but city, but it's also give a kind of distinct, almost like a neon light, like as the effect in the kind of our building. So that's kind of very interesting way how it will kind of moving around um, so that's i think will be the really the strengths of the the tonic's identity i think uh, and also there's another um, question here uh, how will such a branding of museum stand alongside museum that have been a uh, brand with uh, brand with time Things again, maybe? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think that this is quite a kind of exciting step forward. Um, you know, the safest thing to do would have been to go for a system that worked on um, a very strong kind of grid, very strong templates focused on typography and keep a very, very strong control. Um, but th again, that's not really how branding is developing now because you know we're seeing these ideas develop in parallel. The idea of retail being so significant, the idea of digital being so significant. So this, this, the possibilities that come with this are much more interesting. So I think this will be a, a, a kind of step forward especially because we aim to embrace it so fully across those areas. And what's exciting is M plus is a startup. So it can introduce all these things at the same time. Um, the, the challenges are, you know, how you create a brand that is free enough to give possibilities, but also main, maintains a very coherent kind of idea. But I think this is something that what was exciting was Thomas has actually proved that their approach to color can work and their approach to digital works. They've seen that in other examples, so it, it's been proven. And I feel that, you know, that was one reason why we did look at how we could necessarily give people color palettes they could work with. So a kit of color palettes they could work with initially. And then, as mentioned, as projects develop, there's more freedom to take them further. Mm. 
I see. And then also, the Thomas, uh, in your presentation, you said, like, you know, of the, your studio has been running 25 years, and then, of course, it started it's quite different medium from the beginning. And then you said it's changed to today's to the digital first. When that kind of shift has started and why that was essential to start the think, thinking about the design, why digital first? We're looking, I'm looking at the screen now. <laughs> You're still there, <laughs> live. <laughs> so um, I think this is half half of what uh, the reality now is. Um, most people at home will be looking at the screen. A few people are in the audience. So uh, yeah, it, it's obvious that, that screens are there to, to, to stay. We actually made a whole exhibition at the Van Abbe Museum together with the Design Academy Eindhoven about uh, how RGB colors and screens, how they really influence everything in our life. Because we went from, from colors that reflect to colors that shine. And because in the, in the, in the from behind, it, uh, it starts with black and then color is added. But uh, in paintings and in, in, uh, in, 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 in posters, you start with a white paper and then the, the the color is on it. So it's a totally different way of thinking. And that is why um, at Tonic we're so happy that we started in the old way and changed to the new way because we can really bridge the two. For us, it is digital first, but we're really always talking about how to connect the print and the reality and the outdoor to the screen uh, and what happens there. So. Bridging those two worlds, I think, is one of is one of the most uh, is, is the key challenge of design at the moment. Yeah, I mean, actually, we didn't show the the slide today, but there's a one of the also the examples that Tony has presented to us. Maybe let's say take a one of the the image of the collection, and then you can extract the color, and then you can kind of add this uh, the, the the apply to this logic. So it's still again the the I think your the identity is not almost like beyond branding. Like it's trigger our way of way of seeing. So almost like by looking at maybe you just experience exactly as you said. Maybe we look at the painting or the object, but then the the through visual identity we start to kind of recognize to what's the color palette within each object. So that's, I think, it's also the very interesting way. And then also the, the somehow the museum is still, yes, we are going to a lot of digital today, but we are hoping we can welcome our you know, audience to the museum. But it's also the, the collection is a kind of history of color palettes, you know, from the pigments and textile dyeing, ceramic grazing and the industrial lacquer paint. So there is a lot of lots of color palettes you can kind of pull, which also can be kind of another, maybe we can even apply to the maybe learning program or something like uh, to expand the, our mm. maybe identity, yeah. maybe. Uh, um, one other point, actually, I mean, I mean, we had a limited time, so it was skipped over, but I'd really like also to, to kind of really recognize the font that Thomas picked and the, 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 the power that that has because it's a really, really, um, it's a really very attractive font. And, and what's interesting about it is the font itself really helps to define the tone of voice. Um, it has a quite a kind of, um, it, it, it works very well in low and upper case. It, it's not a capital style font. It's very relaxed. It has a very informal style. And, and the great thing about a font like that is also it, it forces you to have a dialogue in a certain way. It, for, it actually drives the style of language, which we want to be welcoming and informal. And, and that, in combination with the color, I think will go a long way to making people who you know, don't know much about M+, or maybe have their own views on what museums, feel more comfortable about crossing the threshold. Uh, and I think that's going to be a very, that's a very powerful element, actually, in the design that we didn't really get a chance to talk about. But it's, it's a really significant part. Right. I have one more question, which probably suits to Dorian. Uh, do you have any suggestion for the museum to establish better museum experience for the audience? <laughs> this is a, a very, very big question. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a question that has been around since time immemorial, in, in you know, for all museums. But perhaps um, ever more um, urgent and pertinent in this year. Um, 
because of course uh, museums are is one of the industries that have been close to being devastated um, because it uh, relies so much, especially if you are large museums in cities that have large tourism, then, then of course you rely on visitorship. Um, so the last thing that Thomas said in response to the last question of what is really critical in tonics but also many other graphic designers work is now bridging between digital and print and virtual and physical. And I think that actually describes exactly the challenge that all museums are trying to solve right now. I think the question of what is the relationship between online and on-site has been around for quite some time, if not as long as the history of the internet. I remember very clearly when the second life, the, the online, virtual reality game was all the rage, I think maybe somewhere between 12 to 15 years ago, then there was all this discussion about whether museums should have a virtual museum in Second Life. And I think nothing really came out of that. And to be perfectly honest, I think that museums are still grasping the relation, what, what is the right relationship between online and on-site, while, of course, Nobody can avoid from going, uh, investing a lot of you know, financial and human resources. All museums have to do that, but I think that the, the grasping is still continuing. I think what's become also clear is that still, I mean, if I may say, so maybe there are many other museum colleagues will disagree that I think that what we are doing in online space is to still drive the physical visitorship rather than really thinking of it as a feedback loop or more creative space. Of course, in this COVID time, all museums have pivoted digitally to provide content to the public. But I think what we have to think about more is that it's not, digital isn't just in service of bringing physical visitorship to the museums. So I think that's very appropriate also in discussion of our M plus branding because it, as Kingsley described it, it is actually a creative tool rather than simply driving um, PR or marketing for what museums doing in the building. Okay, thank you, Dorian. And then it's actually really the time is really ending. And thank you, Thomas and Kingsley and Dorian. And then for the, the audience who has been listening on a Saturday afternoon. So hope we can meet uh, soon in our future museum, but it's also we have a lot of online programs as well. Thank you very much for joining us.